right, good evening. It is 5.03 p.m. on Thursday, April 23rd. And I'd like to call to order a special meeting of the Board of Education of the Wausau School District. All Wausau School District Board of Education meetings will be conducted as a virtual meeting due to an active emergency situation, COVID-19 pandemic, meaning that multiple board members may be participating in the meeting from remote locations through the use of communications technology and that public access to the meeting may be arranged through the use of technology. Members of the media and public may attend in person by calling 1-715-261-0598 or through the virtual WebEx meeting at, um, that's quite a website there. Mm -hmm. If I go to the homepage, it's located on our homepage. Okay, if you go to the homepage of the Wausau School District, the link is located there and that is wausauschools.org. All participants' phones, microphones, and chat dialog boxes will be muted or disabled during the meeting. Members of the public who do not wish to appear in person may view the meeting live by the Wassa Area Access Media on the Government and Education Cable Channel 981. Wassa Area Access Media also live streams the meeting on HTTPS uh, colon backslash backslash WAAM dot V-I-E-B-I-T dot com. The meeting will also be available on the WASA Area Access Media YouTube channel a few days after filming. All meeting access information shall also appear in a prominent location on the WASA School District website. For those individuals with disabilities, including individuals with visual or hearing impairments, as well as individuals who may have limited access to technology, please contact Deputy Clerk Cassie Peck at 715-261-0505 or cpec at wasaschools.org. And uh, before we move to agenda item two, I would just like to uh, say hello to fellow board members and please, as a reminder, keep your microphones muted until Clerk Peck calls on you. We will probably move a little bit slower in transitions than our inaugural virtual meeting a couple weeks ago. So please bear with us. And um, please remember to raise your hand for uh, if you have a question, comment, or concern, and Cassie will be sure to let us know. With that, we'll move on to agenda item two, and um, that is Bob Tess, with potentially an update as it relates to the student transportation contract amendment. Thank you. Oh. Based, Based on, on the direction I got from the uh, school board 10 days ago, I started discussions with first student to negotiate uh, at least an amendment to the contract, perhaps a new five-year contract that includes a concession for what happens when uh, the unpredictable, like not having school for 51 days happens. Uh, we're still in discussions. In fact, as a matter of fact, uh, this afternoon, I was still talking to first student about a uh, possible agreement. We were yet to come to an agreement, so we'll probably see this again on Monday's uh, agenda. Okay, are there any um, questions, comments, or concerns for Bob from the board? I know I don't have any. I see nothing. Okay, then we will move on to agenda item three and discussion of a potential referendum. And I will turn that over to Dr. Hiltz. Thank you, Mrs. Zunker. Good evening, Wausau School Board members and members of our staff and the community who joined our meeting to learn more about this proposal to reinvent the future of the Wausau School District. Before we begin, I'd like to make a, a couple of comments. Um, first, I want to thank everyone who contributed to this proposal. Certainly the, the district level administrative team and the school board. I also want to thank the principals and other members of the administrative team who've been developing this proposal with me. But know that really this proposal started when parents and community members and staff started sharing their vision uh, their, for, a, for a better school district. When I held 25 listening sessions when I first came to Wausau and when we conducted the, uh, the ideation sessions, you all shared dreams and concerns and asked that we listen to you. 
and you asked us to think strategically and innovatively. And this proposal reflects a plan to help us achieve what it is we hear you asking for. And even before I arrived, the school board had begun to develop a shared vision for the district. When you spoke to me, you talked about kids being at the heart of our decisions, and this proposal has children at its center. Second, some people think this may be the wrong time to talk about a referendum. And certainly we realize that people are more concerned about the, the pandemic and keeping their jobs and the economy, but I don't think it's ever a bad time to talk about improving schools for our students. And know that any changes that might occur wouldn't happen until the fall of 2023. We started this conversation today so people aren't caught off guard, so people do have time to become aware of this proposal, so they do have time to discuss it and understand it. And what I truly value about a referendum is that it engages a community conversation about the future of education. We all know Wausau School District is a great district, and now we want it to be even better. And that's the purpose of this proposal. So to begin, you see the title page, and as always, we start with our mission in mind. And that mission is to advance the student learning, achievement, and success. And that is for every student. <clears throat> and if you'll bear with us, I'm, I'll be asking uh, Cassie to, to forward the, the slides. In addition to our mission, we want to, we want to keep, uh, be mindful of our shared key interests. And I'll just point out a few highlights of these. Obviously, it starts again with advancing student learning and success. It speaks to using research-based curriculum. It speaks to the re providing real-life, diverse learning opportunities. We have an interest in informing and engaging the community, as we're doing now. We have an interest in attracting, retaining, a creative and innovative workforce. We want to provide safe, secure, inviting, well-maintained environments for our students and our staff. We have an interest in expanding technology to maximize learning for all. And lastly, we want to foster mutual beneficial partnerships. So that's where we start. And uh, as I mentioned in my opening statements, this really begins with our people, uh, our staff, our parents, and the community. So briefly, I want to review feedback and summarize it before we launch into the, the referendum itself. And if people are interested in seeing a full presentation, they can go back to the January 27th board meeting where we shared uh, a, a broader discussion about uh, community feedback. So first of all, uh, it's always good to start where people feel great things are happening and again just highlighting uh, what people have said. People are very proud of our curriculum. They're very proud of our teachers, proud of our staff, they're proud of our partnerships. Oh, and even administration. <laughs> you want to go to the next casting? Sorry. Um, in addition to things that they're proud of and things, and, and things that are going very well, um, there are also challenges. And, you know, staff retention is one of those first things that come to mind and followed closely by behavior and mental health concerns and social challenges, um, challenges about expanding programming and challenges about dealing with the boundaries and those enrollment trends. We asked people to look ahead and if things were going well, 10 years from now, what would the newspaper headlines say? And people hoped that they would speak about high academic achievement, community-minded graduates who were career ready. Uh, they hoped they would speak about great places for people to work and innovative curriculum and innovative programming and every student experiencing success. As we asked them about the facilities, the first thing that came up was, please fix the boundary issues. Then they spoke about building infrastructure and ed ed educational adequacy, safety, and community engagement. And as always, I always appreciate good advice. And what people have asked us is, please listen to your staff, engage your staff, focus on student needs, 
engage with the community and our parents. Be innovative, be strategic, and again, please fix the boundaries. This was just a, a word cloud that again, if you go back to that January 27th meeting, you will uh, see several of these. We tried to capture people's words uh, that led to this, this summary data. And of course, in this case, you can see the declining enrollment, uh, declining population, the river, talking about the, the overcrowding on the west side. So again, just trying to capture some, some of the voice that people were willing to share with us. A couple more slides from that January 27th meeting and capturing the community's voice. Uh, in a scientific survey, a, a demographically representative survey, we asked uh, our community members um, a number of questions, and I just captured a few here. One, what do they like most about our district? And you can see consistently uh, it's about our teachers and our opportunities for students and the high achievement. Um, those are the things that people are really valuing. And when asked what the most serious issues were, most people said either nothing or they weren't sure. There's a few comments about some facilities and some spending, but overall, people are very satisfied, very happy with the district. Excuse me. And lastly, they were asked about the value. Uh, and they believe, the community believes that schools are a good investment. And you can see some of the data there. For the benefit of those who are attending uh, via phone only, uh, I'll just say that the, some of the, the, uh, the measures were uh, asked about, do we spend money effectively? Are we a good value investment? Do we spend past referendum funds responsibly? Um, and, and in all these cases, the community uh, overwhelmingly agreed that, that, we're, that we have managed our finances well and that the schools are a good investment. So as I try to summarize two years of, of conversations and input and from all these various stakeholders. This is what we hear people asking for. Safe schools for students and staff. And safe, safe means much more than just physically safe. It means socially and emotionally safe, even academically safe, and we'll talk more about that later. They want high achievement for every student. They want every staff person to have a great place to work. We want the district to be more efficient and set up for future success. They want students who are prepared to be successful members of our community and be in strong partnerships with our families in our community. So that's the vision. That's, that's the, those are the goals that we have moving forward. At each of these slides, these branded slides uh, with our mission, I will stop and, and look to see if board members have any questions or comments. Do you see anything? Have to oh, do you have to zip screen out? and go. Oh. They could unmute and say something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, just a little direction, a little management of our meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Peck is uh, is displaying the screen. So if board members have questions or comments, we would need you to unmute and and sh and tell us. Jim has his hand up. Jim Boucher. Yes. Jim, Jim, are you there? Yep. Yeah. Can you unmute? Oh, no. Oh, wait, hold on. He, he, he is, he's waving. Okay. Sorry, Sorry Jim. Jim. Did, did you have something? Did you have something? No. Okay. No. Okay. We're going to pass. Okay. You set? Set. Okay, we're good. I don't see any hands up. Okay. I think, does Cassie need to shut off her volume or did you do it already? It's off. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so in this next segment of the presentation, after listening to what people want, um, the next step is to talk about the why. Why would we need to reinvent the district in order to achieve those goals? And we're going to look at that why from several viewpoints. And the three viewpoints that we're really going to analyze this from is one, uh, we have to have the safest schools with well-behaved, engaged students if we're going to raise achievement levels and create the best place to work. Secondly, every student, regardless of address, must have access to every high-quality program we offer. And lastly, 
We've got to make the best use of our resources so we can offer that world-class education to our students. So let's begin to explore the why. First of all, we are just a continuous improvement organization. It's in our DNA. We look at data, we have conversations, and we change. We improve every day. Beyond that, we are preparing students for a future that we can't envision yet and for careers that don't even exist. And I just highlighted a few in the next few slides to get an idea of, of what I mean by that. First, I wonder if anybody's ever heard of a cyber city analyst, and I doubt you have because they don't exist yet. <laughs> um, but in, city, in future cities, there's going to be sensors across the city that measure a number of things. Someone has to monitor those and measure those and, and repair them when they, when they aren't working. That's what a cyber city, uh, cyber city analyst might do. Next, you know, highway controller, autonomous vehicles and, and drone deliveries. Someone has to manage that traffic uh, with, with unmanned vehicles. That might be a future career. This one is very near in the future, a genom genomic portfolio director. I happen to see a number of school uh, colleges and, and industries that are already working in this. So are we preparing students for this kind of a career? Or as we, as we move to industry 4.0 and, and, and uh, more robotic uh, work, um, how do we help people and machines work effectively and efficiently together? That might be someone's career. So that's the uncertain future we're trying to prepare our students for. Today, we can look at some data that we're very sure of. We know that our, that our uh, population's declining, that our enrollment's declining, and that's not just Wausau, that's the whole northern tier of, of Wisconsin. And secondly, when we look at open enrollment data, as you look at this chart, there's a blue line that's fairly flat, and that's uh, students choosing to come in, and the red line is, is families choosing, to, choosing to, to leave our district, to go to other districts. Um, that is a concerning trend to me, and what it says to me is that people are looking for something different, so we need to respond to that. So I'll pause here again. That's the beginnings of the, uh, that's the why I feel we need to reinvent. Next, we would be moving on to what are we, how does a referendum help us accomplish that? But I'll pause to see if anybody has any questions. Do you see anything or hear anything? I'm not hearing anything. I could move on to what we're trying to accomplish with the referendum, right? Uh, yeah, if board members have any questions, you can unmute yourselves and ask them at this time. Otherwise, Keith is going to continue on with the presentation. All right, doesn't sound okay. good. I'm hearing, I'm hearing nothing, nothing, so I'll continue. Good. And there's a couple other opportunities we have to pause and, and, and answer any questions. So now we've just kind of summarizing. We've talked about what people are telling us. We've talked about uh, that vision. We've talked about why in order to accomplish that vision we need to reinvent. So let's talk about how the referendum help us, helps us achieve those goals. And again, we want to try to summarize these, these goals in, 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 a, in a comprehensible fashion. So these are the five goals that I, I believe will help us move forward for this referendum. One, we want to have improved student wellness, improved student achievement, and behavior. Secondly, we want an efficient future-focused district. We want to ensure that this district is a great place to work for all staff members. We want to improve our service to families, and we want to expand our partnerships. So that's what I have in mind. Keep that in mind as we talk about the goals for this referendum. So firstly, we want to talk about the students, because as I said at the beginning, the students are at the heart of this proposal. So this is a, a slide about improving student wellness, achievement, and behavior. You'll see a couple of concepts here about uh, having full pupil service teams and behavior support rooms in every school. 
about increasing equity to programming, supporting student social and emotional and academic growth, the, uh, in, improving students' pro-social behaviors, and developing those future-minded citizens. We're also talking about enhanced student uh, school safety and student engagement. And on this slide, uh, I believe Mrs. Lloyd, our pupil services director, would like to uh, have some conversation about this. Angie, did you want to add to this slide? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, I would like to add just a couple of things to that. Um, as we're thinking about safety and security of our buildings, we currently have 20 buildings, 22 programs. Um, and it with increased safety and security always on our minds. Uh, we're constantly thinking of different ways that we can enhance the safety and security. At this point, we are as safe and secure in our buildings as we possibly can be. We would like to get safe and secure vestibules at all of our schools um, and we go through with this referendum that will enable us to do that. We also need um, PA announcement systems that are current and up to date. Those are also a very hefty investment. Um, so that, that's due to a number of things that safety and security is number one with our PA systems that will enable us to not only get new PA systems, but then to get the enhancements that will increase safety and security at all of our buildings. Um, the pupil services team, currently we have pupil services staff in all of our buildings. However, they're often in two or three buildings which means they're not at our buildings full time. Uh, this would enable us to have full pupil services teams as well as full health teams at each one of our buildings. Uh, and we, we now know how incredibly important that is. We would also like to implement bridge rooms at each of our buildings that is um, to help students who are going through difficult times in their lives or difficulties, a place for them to go where they can decompress, where they can talk Staff about what they're going through and gain skills to help them go back into their classrooms. Again, we would need less buildings in order to implement them at every building. Uh, we know that behavior comes from a lot of things that kids go through outside of our buildings, including, including trauma, and we're looking at the best ways that we can help all of our kids every single day. Thank you, Angie. Um, Dr. Hiltz or Angie, uh, could one of you just explain what a full pupil service team looks like for those that might not be aware of what that's comprised of? Sure. Um, we have currently 9.5 social workers in our in our school district. We would like to get one at every building full time. So that's a school social worker. That is not a county social worker. We employ our own social workers within the district. Um, we would be able to have at least one guidance counselor, if not more, at each of our elementary buildings. At our secondary buildings, we already have um, those people in place that could potentially increase counselors at our secondaries as well. And then um, school psychs, those school psychologists, we would be able to have one in each of our buildings as well. Thank you. Can I pause? Mm -hmm. There's a number of people saying they're unable to get into the meeting. Okay. So can I not scare, share my screen yes. for a minute? Please. Oh, yeah. Trying mm -hmm. to figure something out. So should we just take a little break? Hey. I don't know. Should we do this through transportation? I don't know if we should. No. Too tight? Okay. Do you have an answer? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so um, for board members and, and administration and whoever's on the call and on the screen, uh, Clerk Peck is just trying to assist some individuals that are trying to get into the meeting. Uh, so we're just going to take just a, a couple minutes here and pause while she uh, tries to assist these individuals. Don't worry, as long as it takes, it takes. Mm -hmm. We're okay. Yep. We're fine.
268 is in water. That's a lot. 268. Good. The more the better. I like people who have information. Is that any It's on the participant uh, total. It's not picking up, and I don't know how to fix what they're having problems with. Okay. Who's not picking up? John. John Uding? John Uding? No, I'm here, right here. Oh. Hi, John. So I'm in, in the middle of the meeting, and I don't, I turned off um, registration when I created the meeting, so I don't know why it's requesting that people put in anything to get into the meeting. Yeah, I, I didn't require any registration. Okay, I guess we're just gonna have to continue and... Yeah. Okay, okay. thanks, Jen. Yeah. He, he you, doesn't know. Are you able to provide the phone number to those individuals and ask them to call in instead? It's it's in the posting the phone number for them. I've been the nobody's called in now. Um, okay. Yeah. They can always. They can always watch it later. Mm -hmm. You know. Go oh, on yeah. YouTube in I'm a couple of days to, as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. No, nope. and now we are we are it's looking at the things. Te yes. Technological things. Things. So um, we will continue on with the meeting, mm -hmm. and um, this will be available on YouTube in a couple of days for viewing at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I believe Dr. Hiltz, we're, we're we back to you presenting on the next slide. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Cassie. You can go to the next slide, please. Yeah. I inserted uh, this graphic that you saw before when we when the board first approved the whole child whole WASA strategic plan, and I inserted it here to remind ourselves that um, when we uh, complete or or make progress in one goal area of our strategic plan, it really reinforces all of the others. So, for instance, in that previous slide, when we talk about improving student wellness. Uh, and behavior and and social emotional health that will impact the quality of our uh, of our working environment of our student achievement of our staff <laughs> retention so that's the purpose of inserting this infographic uh, at this time now we'll return back to the next slide and continue to address how this referendum can help us achieve our goals um, we want to make sure this is a great place for people to work and I've had a, a number of, of staff over the years ask me, you know, how can this, how, how can my position be uh, full time? How can I be in one school so I can develop relationships with students and staff? So that's an important part of, uh, of, of the work climate for our people. That also enhances job security. Each spring, this time of year, people aren't, some, some staff aren't sure if their job will be full time next year. Um, we want that to be uh, a, a question they don't have to worry about. So that would offer enhanced supports for our staff, um, equity across uh, you know, uh, caseloads and, and uh, other aspects for our staff. Here I want to introduce the possibility. This is not a guarantee, uh, but you know, as we move forward, as we create the best district possible, we have a strong interest in developing a child care facility. That's a, it's a great need in our district and would also be a great asset to our staff. So that's, that's a, an idea I want to continue to hold here and see if that's something we might want to pursue. 
Um, we would like to have elementary principal teams um, to be a, a single principal in charge of everything uh, across the school. We think that uh, to have teams would make them more effective, offer more supports for our staff, our students, and our families. And lastly, of course, this all improves uh, the level of staff wellness. Third component is an efficient and a future-focused district. And just a couple of notes here. We know we have limited resources, everybody does. We want to make sure that we're making the best use of those uh, and focusing those, those resources on student needs. Uh, additionally, we'd like to address those long-standing enrollment issues. Um, we know about overcrowding on some west side schools and, and, and we want to fix that problem. We, uh, we also want to create effective school environments. We want them to be secure. Uh, we want to have effective communications, flexible, healthy, comfortable spaces. And I think again at this point, uh, Mrs. Lloyd and perhaps Mr. Seiler wanted to make some comments on this slide. Talking about um, that enhanced system with the with communication. Um, I don't know, Larry Seiler, if you wanted to add anything to that, but that's part of that safety and security piece. So our our, our communication system is antiquated, as you mentioned. Um, it is difficult to find parts for it anymore and keep it running effectively. Um, we also want to tie in other school systems into that life safety system things like emergency announcements fire alarms tornado alarms active intruder alarms things of that nature so that we can communicate not just within a school but within a district um, as far as flexibility and healthy schools obviously some of our schools have become old and dated a lot of the finishes are um, 70s and 80s vintage um, we can improve on those as well as making them more comfortable with improved heating and ventilating systems thank you, thank you. go to the next one all right and of course we are interested in improving our service to families so again I'll mention the possibility of uh, child care facilities uh, improve that su the support for the student behavior and their social emotional needs. As we help students, we certainly help their families. I'll introduce one other possibility here. Would, would uh, families be interested in, in a year-round school option? Um, that's a conversation that we can engage in in the next months. Uh, a service that the district used to provide was after-school activities and after-school busing. Um, Again, perhaps as we start to talk about being more efficient, we could reinvest some of our uh, revenues into some programs that could, again, improve service to families. And as you heard from Mrs. Lloyd and Mr. Seiler, we're very interested in enhancing our school safety. And partnerships. Um, we're interested in expanding our career connections for our, our middle and high school students. You see some of the areas of interest uh, listed there. We also want to develop new peer and alternative high school spaces. And lastly, offer more opportunities for different high school uh, and, and middle school pathways, perhaps more virtual opportunities or more connections with higher education. So before we talk about the, the referendum project itself, I think it would be remiss if we didn't talk about how this referendum would support Whole Child, Whole Wausau. Um, but before I do, I'll just check to see if there are any questions. Again, I'm hearing none. So I'm going to continue, and we can, can certainly take questions at the end. So I will go through this a little more quickly because we've already uh, spoken to some of this, but for instance, within our service strand, as we talk about expanding career programming or expanded family supports, that is supporting directly our, the goals we have within our service strand of the Whole Child, Whole Wausau plan. 
in the people strand. We spoke about this earlier, but to improve our working climate for a number of our uh, staff, we could have fewer part-time staff and or staff that are split between buildings. We actually have a low student-teacher ratio, but we can't leverage it right now, and we would like to take advantage of that. We could improve job security, create that, that welcoming and that respectful climate, and stronger staff support systems, whether it's stable staffing environments, and of course the improved student behavior supports. Wellness, we've spoken about this a number of times, we could have stronger behavior supports and more opportunities for healthy activities. Achievement, obviously this is the heart of our plan and I make a note under this subtitle here that really everything here leads to improved academic achievement. But from a referendum perspective, this is a, an opportunity for us to create some of our improved learning spaces um, more active, more flexible, perhaps introduce maker spaces, which we can explore at a later date. Perhaps we could introduce um, instructional coaches. And of course, as Mr. Seiler mentioned, you know, improve that, that, uh, that climate, the healthy environments, the natural light, the temperature, and again, the safety and security, which is so important to us. And then, of course, optimization of resources. To be more efficient means there's potential savings, and we can take those savings and reinvest them into our strategic priorities. You'll see some projected numbers here. I know Mr. Tess has been working with uh, folks from Nexus, who's our um, performance contractor, and, and we we've, we've have a, a lot of faith in these potential savings. In addition to those, um, there's a few other pieces of here around the optimization of resources, including um, enhanced security measures, um, creating a dedicated space for the WAVE school, a new school for Montessori that we'll talk about a little bit later, and again, new, new spaces for peer and alternative high school. So that's the direct connection to, uh, between the referendum and Whole Child, Whole Wausau. So again, I'm just going to go back to the beginning really quickly and say, this is what we heard you ask for. This is why we feel we need to reinvent the district to achieve those goals. Um, this is how the, the referendum can support those goals. And, and unless there are questions, now I'll hop into and explain the, the actual uh, projected, uh, the, uh, the proposed project for this referendum. So if board members had questions, you could ask now. Seeing none? Seeing. All right. All right, so then, this is how, this is what we're proposing. To achieve our goals, we're proposing to create seven <coughs> elementary schools serving students in grades K through four. Those seven schools will be located at the locations listed here, and again, for people who are calling in, I'll read those off. Those seven schools will be located on the campuses of Statine Elementary, South Mountain Elementary, John Marshall Elementary, Riverview, Thomas Jefferson, Hawthorne Hills, and G.D. Jones. In a moment, Mr. Tess and Nexus will speak to why those uh, spaces were identified. And I think it's very important to note here, uh, this is not about reducing staff. Staff who are with us are important and no staff would lose their jobs as a result of this project. The second bigger, comp the biggest components of this would be to create a single whole middle school system. We would propose to create uh, an intermediate school serving students in grades five and six in the John Muir building and a middle school serving students in grades seven and eight in the Horace Mann building. Another important note is that we want to engage staff and parents and community teams to help us redevelop these schools and these programs um, so that they're developmentally aligned and, and everybody understands the why and, and the, 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 the needs that can be met through, through the reinventing of these schools. At this time, I'm going to stop and I'm going to, to uh, shift the presentation over to Mr. Tess. Um, and he's, he and uh, the team from Nexus will speak a little bit more to the why and give us some details um, about, again, how those sites were selected 
uh, some of the savings projections, and a little bit about um, some of the actual floor plans. And just a note, um, the, the floor plans are, are general. Um, we aren't going to get into uh, a lot of detail on that, but we want you to have a, a vision for what this might look like. Mr. Tess? I just need a minute because Teresa is in as a and I have to scooter because she has a okay. We'll take a moment here. Yeah, we're going to take a moment here just to attend to uh, one other person, and we'll be right back with you. Should be selling her space. <laughs> yeah. This is where the elevator music comes. From. Mm -hmm. I think you say anything else I could comment on while she's. I mean, All right, Teresa's now a panelist. Okay. I'll go back to the presentation. One more down. Microsoft PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. You want the PowerPoint? Stop sharing that one. Stop sharing. Or just flip to the PowerPoint. Now we want to go to Bob. Mode. There now, we go. Right there. Beginning. Now, duplicate screen. Hold on. I see it on my screen. Now it's doing this. See the whole thing? We're good. It's showing her. Um, Are you seeing the whole screen? Mm, I'm seeing that. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. The whole thing or just this? The whole thing, the next slide, too. Hmm. Then we got to do something else. Uh, you didn't do F8, did you? I did do F8. I put it on duplicate. Hmm. So you're seeing everything? Mm hmm. All right, is my mic live on here? Not right now. I gotta close out this, perhaps. That's full screen. That's what I see now. I don't know how to get the uh, okay, go to. I'm sorry, I'm close. Go to the sharing screen. There we go. turn my volume down right. so we get feedback. Maybe if someone in the audience on live virtually could raise a thumb if they can hear you. Paul Weber in particular. If you can hear me, give a thumbs up because I can see you right mm -hmm. now. Okay. All right, thumbs up. Gotcha. <laughs> good. good. So what do I do with that to get it out of there? We don't want to see Paul necessarily. Oh, you're going to make it the, <laughs> what, the icon on the left. Hey, Bob, I don't see that on my screen. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we go. Dr. Hiltz uh, took an opportunity to talk a little bit about the why of the proposed plan and why we're doing everything, a little bit of the what, and I'll talk a little bit about the how and some of the logistics and I won't disappoint, there will be some dollar signs, there will be some numbers, there will be some graphs, there will be all those things that I'm known for, right? So you'll get to see some visuals uh, that help explain our plan. This is simply a picture of all of our K-5 elementary students, current K-5 elementary students with existing boundaries for our 13 elementary schools. We know that more of our students live closer to uh, the middle of the city and fewer live on the outlying areas. Uh, that's important when we're considering a, a merger plan. Uh, maybe you knew this, maybe you suspected it, maybe you didn't know it at all, but our 13 elementary schools, when we consider the 100 largest school districts, not schools in the state, but the 100 largest school districts in the state, our elementary schools are a little bit smaller, which means there are more of them. Having 13 elementary schools in a district our size is considered a lot of elementary schools. I'm gonna have to move this picture off to the side. Not for us, but just not so you for know. you, so I can see what I'm looking right. at. <laughs> So here's a, a visual of how our elementary school is staffed and what we spend on elementary school staffing. Not advancing, let me click. That's not advancing either. Nor is that, there we there go. There it is. Okay, the white on top is the average of the 100 largest school districts in Wisconsin. The blue is the Wausau School District. The first pair of numbers represent how much we spend per student for all salary in all of our elementary school buildings. The second one is 
just teacher salary in all of our elementary school buildings. You'll notice that in both cases, the Wausau School District spends a little bit more money on staffing our elementary schools than what a typical school our size would do. Dr. Hiltz mentioned earlier, we have a favorable staffing ratio. We're simply not leveraging it, and we would want to leverage it. The last two numbers are the actual staffing ratio. That, that represents how many students for every staff member, and in the last one, the students per teaching staff member. Again, a lower number there would represent fewer students per staff member. That same data in a more visual display, this is a chart, but it also acts as a graph because you see where WASA is relative to the rest of the state. Uh, WASA is pretty uh, high on that list, meaning WASA spends a lot of money per staff member at our elementary schools. This one suggests WASA will spend a little bit more than typical for teaching staff member at the elementary schools. This represents WASA's a little bit higher than typical for number of uh, or lower than typical for number of staff members per student. We have fewer students for staff members and fewer students per teaching staff member. This is just elementary schools across the state of Wisconsin, WASA being highlighted in blue. That same thing doesn't happen with high schools. And I had high schools and elementaries and those are the ones that made it into the slideshow. It would be very similar if we looked at middle schools, very similar to high schools. Our high schools are pretty typically sized. And because they're typically sized, you'll see WASA land in the middle of each one of these or close to the middle of each one of these. Uh, that's not unusual. When you have a fairly typical sized high school, you would land in the middle. So we have some staffing inefficiencies. We spend a lot of money on staffing at the elementaries, and that is largely a function of having 13 elementary schools. This is a schematic of all of our 13 elementary schools with their boundaries obviously not drawn to scale, intentionally distorted, so we can fit text boxes in where we need to convey some data. There's a little bit about each one of them, including when they were built, significant additions, uh, and things like that. Relative to each other, they're placed pretty accurately. The size is obviously not accurate. Some of our uh, inner city, so to speak, enrollment areas or attendance areas are quite small, and some of our outlying ones are quite big. You'll see on a subsequent slide. Uh, a lot of data uh, for each of our 13. When we try to decide which of those 13 schools we want to continue to invest in, uh, we used a lot of data and long, long discussions. And some of the factors that we use to contribute to which schools we're going to continue to invest in and merge was the student concentration. You saw the map a little while ago. That map tells us where our students live. Uh, the cost to modernize and or expand the school. Some schools are very easy to expand. Some schools were built with expansion in mind. Same goes for the site itself. Some sites are very easy to expand on. They lend themselves nicely to an expansion. Other sites, not so much. Uh, we considered every one of our 13 elementary schools the need for deferred maintenance and other needs in that building. Did we have a separate cafeteria and gymnasium? We wanted that. Did we have air conditioning? We wanted that. Did we have suitable parking lots and traffic flow and things like that? We wanted that. And then, of course, other recent investments made at each site. The size of that investment and how recent it was. In fact, the next slide, I've circled three schools that we have certainly invested in recently. These are the four elementary schools in which we added 4K academies in 2016. So in 2016, these four schools saw considerable investment by the community. Statine is our newest elementary school, built about 20 years ago. It also sits on a site that lends itself to expansion, and the building itself has been expanded once already, and it is very uh, uh, suitable for expansion. Similar to South Mountain, South Mountain is a very new elementary school. The site lends itself to expansion, the building itself lends itself to expansion. Down in the lower right-hand corner, 
uh, a schematic picture of the John Marshall attendance area. John Marshall, in spite of its age, is a very solid building, very well constructed. It does lend itself very well to uh, a small addition at least. It sits on a very suitable site. It also serves kind of a, an isolated part of our district in the southeast corner uh, that, that needs a school. So uh, we're gonna merge schools into that school. Now, if you look at these four on the west side and these three on the east side, these are the same schools that Dr. Hiltz mentioned a little while ago as the ones that we wanna continue to invest in. These are the ones that we wanna merge into. On top of this visual, I'll go through each one of these schools in a K-4 merger plan. This would be K-4, the existing schools are K-5, and you will see some capacity numbers. For the last eight or nine years, every time we've talked about capacity in the Wausau School District, we've talked about operational capacity. And operational capacity, if you're new to this discussion, is 90% of full capacity. So full capacity would be every one of our classrooms full to the brim. Operational capacity is 90% of that number. So when you see capacity numbers throughout the rest of this presentation, that will be referring to operational capacity. Let's start with South Mountain. You'll notice that Polygon does not exactly cover up South Mountain and Rib Mountain. We don't know exactly what the boundaries are going to look like. It was intentionally not drawn to overlap exactly. It will more than likely consume all of South Mountain's existing boundary and probably or almost all of the Rib Mountain boundary. Uh, South Mountain has a current capacity of 248. It's noteworthy to understand that that is a K-5 capacity. So a K-5 capacity at 248, we would build on to that building, and you'll see a site plan in a little while, that would add 181 capacity, and the new capacity is not a K-5 capacity, that is a K-4 capacity. And K-4 does take a little bit more space than a K-5 because a fifth grade classroom usually has more students in it. The lower the grade level, uh, the, the lower the threshold of how many students we put in each one of those rooms. So a K-4, generally speaking, does have less capacity than a K-5. So that's South Mountain. Here's the same for Statine. We would continue to invest in Statine. We would merge Maine into Statine. Parts of perhaps Jefferson, we don't know what the boundaries are gonna look like exactly. Uh, Statine would undergo significant expansion, uh, additional capacity of 226, leaving a new capacity of 474. It's also worth noting that Statine and Elementary, Statine and South Mountain Elementary are also located in areas that are probably most likely to see population growth in the Wausau School District. We worked with a firm out of the UW-Madison uh, Applied Populations Labs, and they did some research for us, and their research strongly suggested that these two elementary boundary areas may be the only areas that are experiencing population growth and student enrollment growth over the next five to 10 years. That brings us to G.D. Jones Elementary, a, a school that we've recently invested in. They would experience a small addition. They're already a pretty large school. They would turn into a five-track uh, school of capacity 437. Thomas Jefferson Elementary is already a pretty large school. We would build on some capacity, 43 additional capacity to bring it to 437, also a five-track school. On the east side, certainly parts of Hewitt, Texas, of course, most of Riverview would be merged into Riverview Elementary. Small addition, Riverview is already a pretty large school, resulting in a capacity of 429 K-4 students. Hawthorne Hills, our smallest merged school, current capacity 284, would take on some students more than likely from Hewitt, Texas, perhaps from Franklin, maybe even some of the uh, John Marshall students yet to be determined, resulting capacity after the addition of 349 students. 
and in the southeast corner of our district is John Marshall. John Marshall, oddly enough, the capacity would go down in spite of a small addition, and that's because of the difference between a K-4 building holding less students than a K-5 building. Also noteworthy here, John Marshall Elementary, at least according to the plan, that would become an achievement gap reduction school. Uh, you may know that as a SAGE school or an AGR school. And in schools that receive that funding, of which the Wassa School District gets about $1.8 million of funding, the class sizes, generally speaking, are smaller. So John Marshall becoming an AGR school would have that capacity actually going down in spite of a small addition. Uh, Statine would be a non-AGR, South Mountain non-AGR, Thomas Jefferson would be an AGR school, G.D. Jones would be an AGR school, <coughs> Riverview would be non-AGR, Hawthorne Hills and John Marshall would both be AGR schools. Again, the factors that contributed to which buildings were chosen and why they were chosen to continue to invest in, it was a lot more than what you see in this box, but in this box there are five of the leading factors that we used to consider, or we considered for which buildings we continue to invest in. Here's a picture that's not a schematic and it's not distorted and it, you can see how I wouldn't be able to fit much into the Jones box because the Jones attendance area is pretty small in this case. This is a plan. This is a possible boundary plan under K4 merger. Four boundary areas on the west side, three boundary areas on the east side. Again, the factors are repeated. Obviously more K-4 students live on the west side than live on the east side, uh, and the buildings would reflect that. Uh, we would have more capacity on the west side than the east side. It's also noteworthy that prior to this plan, in other words, currently, our elementary schools are at about 87% capacity. And 87% capacity isn't very evenly distributed either. We have some schools that are pretty tight and some schools that aren't so tight and aren't being used as efficiently as they could. Uh, under this proposal, that number would go up to, I believe it's 97%. So we go from 83% up to 97%. Check on those numbers, 87% up to 97%. So obviously we become a lot more efficient in use of our buildings under this plan available capacity in, on both sides of the river, so to speak. Here's a visual, not necessarily a floor plan, more of a site plan with some colors. I'll spend a little bit more time. This is the South Mountain plan. We'll talk about what these visuals look like, then I'll go through them a little bit more quickly, and you can always come back and look at them. Uh, the name of the school is in the lower left. It's a picture of the school and the site itself. In the upper left, uh, we've got figures that represent the current enrollment, square footage, and capacity, and keep in mind that that is for a K-5 building. In this case, 238 is the current enrollment at South Mountain. Square footage is 47,000 and capacity is 248. We're going to add on, and we're going to add enrollment of 190. We're going to add some square footage, 25,000 square feet under this plan, and we would add capacity. And then the proposed K-4 numbers would have an enrollment of 428, square footage of 73,062, and a capacity of 429, pretty close to full. For all practical purposes, 100% of 90% of, of full capacity, so 100% of operational capacity. It's also worth noting that in the South Mountain slide and also the Statine slide, the only places that we took the current enrollment and we increased them by a little bit to reflect what, what Applied Populations Lab told us. In the South Mountain slide, we did add 60 students to the current enrollment uh, based on what Applied Populations told us. All the other enrollment figures are, are current. The green part of the pictures, you see it in the upper left, uh, down in the lower right, in the lower left, 
would be additional space. Those are new additions. Obviously some classrooms are being, being added, but also South Mountain does not have a separate cafeteria, a separate cafeteria and gymnasium. And in this plan, we would build a space that serves just as a cafeteria and we would have the existing space that serves as a gymnasium. Uh, the blue would be remodels and the white would be deferred maintenance and updates and modernization. So many areas of the building would be touched. The white deferred maintenance, the blue remodels, the green would be additional space. You're going to see similar things on each one of our slides. The next one represents the teen elementary. The teen elementary is very suitable for additional space, both the way the site is laid out and the way the building was built. The green spaces directly to the east and down to the southeast represent additional classroom space. Uh, on the upper left, you do see that the enrollment would be expected to go up, merging schools into Statine, square footage going up, obviously the capacity going up to 474. Here's a picture of G.D. Jones Elementary. G.D. Jones does have a pretty small additional square footage addition, uh, some remodel addition, obviously some deferred maintenance and modernization updates as well. Uh, before, or currently, G.D. Jones is only used at a 75% usage, and this would propose being more efficient at a 99% usage. So we become more efficient at G.D. Jones. Very sim similar numbers prevail at Thomas Jefferson. The next picture you see, Thomas Jefferson is currently 73% capacity, and this proposal would bring it to about 98% capacity. Once again, being efficient with tax dollars. Riverview El Elementary. Uh, Riverview Elementary, actually the enrollment would be proposed to go down a little bit. Uh, that has to do with K-5 versus K-4 and shuffling boundaries uh, slightly, but it would also experience a small addition of uh, the office and entry area of 3,800 square feet. Hawthorne Hills is a very interesting site, a uh, challenging site for a few reasons. Uh, when we built our 4K Academy, we experienced some challenges on that site to begin with. If we have a plan that increases the enrollment at Hawthorne Hills by 120 students, uh, we would sure like to relieve some of the traffic congestion. And through a very generous donation from PGA Incorporated about a year ago, we now own much of this land to the north of Hawthorne Hills that would allow us to put another route out or in, depending on how you look at it, uh, for buses and or uh, parent traffic and regular vehicle traffic. That road would be pretty steep, but that's what's in the plans right now. And we've spent some time uh, talking about some of those challenges, and, and we think that's a very viable option to relieve some of the traffic congestion at Hawthorne Hills, especially if we're gonna bring 120 additional students into that school. John Marshall Elementary, very suitable site, a very sturdy building, uh, would add on a small classroom addition to bring in 51 more students. Here the capacity goes down a little bit, as I mentioned earlier. Capacity going down is more a function of it being an AGR school or becoming an AGR school and also a K-4 building versus a K-5 building. Obviously additions and remodels and deferred maintenance is not going to come free. Uh, the bond that we would have to issue for the additions and the remodels that have been mentioned so far, deferred maintenance included in the white spaces on some of the site plans that you see is roughly $19, $19 million for deferred maintenance, $33 million for remodeling and additions and a total budget of $53.3 million. I don't know if we want to pause for questions now. We've talked about the elementary schools. We're going to talk about the middle schools next. What do you think about it? people raising their hand, or are you seeing anything on your screen? Probably is a good idea to stop. 
Oh, yeah. okay. Do I see Jeff Lee? Do I do one of Jeff Lee has a question. Audio. Yeah, I see him. If okay. one of you can turn on your audio, I'll have a lot easier time. Um, exactly one person. Uh, the first is you began the subsoil problems before at Hills building on the west side. Will we have those same problems on the south side? Did you hear that question, Larry? The question was, will we have trouble with the, creating the road on the other side of the building because of the subsoil issues? Yes, we would, right? So, yeah, At Hawthorne, I'm sorry. A very rocky site. And the second question is about uh, putting AC into John Marshall, particularly if we're thinking about trying to in the future run year-round school, that, that would become a necessity. Yeah. If I'm not if muted, I'm give muted. me a thumbs up, Jeff. Yeah. Not muted? Okay, John Marshall would get AC under this proposal, and awesome. all of our elementary schools would have AC. You might see some large numbers in John Marshall, Marshall's uh, deferred maintenance, and that large number, AC contributes to it. Let's put it that way. Can you speak to that road issue around Hawthorne? He's talking right now, somebody oh. let me hear him. I'm sorry, so Jeff, you might have to repeat that question. Sure. When we ran into subsoil problems at Boston on Hills that, that elevated the expense where we operated there, building on the west side of the building, on the south side, do you, do you have an idea that it's going to be the same sort of problem? Probably not on the south side for the building addition, but perhaps for the road. The road, that's going to be a little bit more of an issue, but when you're building a building, you have to bring it to the right grade, and roads can follow different grades. So we have some flexibility with the road that we didn't have with the actual building. And, and I believe, Larry can confirm this, that the southeast side of that building is probably better land to build on than that northwest side was because of the rock and some of those challenges. Right, correct. So as you go north from that building, you get into some very rocky soils. Um, as we go south and east of the building, Yes, we certainly anticipate there would be some moisture and some, some water infiltration out of the hill. Uh, fortunately, what we learned from our last construction uh, project there would help us understand that better and certainly be more well prepared. Okay, he's going to be asking a question. It sounds like we'd be increasing the number of students in ADR classrooms. Do we have an idea of the number of bad or the percentage of bad I got it. Um, can I can speak to it. Could we somewhat repeat the question just yeah, so that people sure. can hear it? Sure. As I understood uh, Dr. Lee's question, it was about the number of AGR schools, the number of AGR or a number of students attending AGR schools and kind of a, a, a percentage and I don't have that number uh, I, I'm wondering if perhaps Mrs. Sheridan might have those numbers otherwise we can certainly get them for you soon what numbers are we talking about exactly can she unmute Andrea you're muted no she's not oh we're turned down no she is Oh, sorry, now you're muted. I think, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Phillips, for that introduction. We currently have six ADR contracts with the state of Wisconsin. We are in our third year of five year contracts for each of those. We will have an opportunity in a year to take a look at our current enrollments at those six ADR schools. We'll be forward with the referendum. I'll suggest you have these and I'll take a look where So that was really hard to hear Andrea's response. Yeah, <laughs> I can respond. I can I can summarize. Okay, for us they can hear it at home easier because they can just turn their volume. Oh, okay. That so we're right. the only ones that are really okay. hearing, other than through the these TV. Guys. Okay. All right. We're just clarifying whether people could hear Mrs. Sheridan's response, and we think 
Uh, while we had a hard time hearing it here in the room, we think that uh, audience members could hear it. But just in case, um, essentially, we need to reanalyze our our AGR contracts and our and our student populations. So it's a little premature to try to be predicting um, percentages or numbers of students served by AGR schools. Is that accurate, Andrea? All right. She. I'm getting a head nod. So. <laughs> All right, do other board members have questions? Otherwise, I know Mr. Tess uh, has some more to share. Um, this is Teresa Miles. I keep trying to talk. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Can you give me some volume here? Yep, we can hear you, Teresa. All right, um, I remember back, this is for um, Larry Seiler. Um, you know, in years past when teachers have really complained about air conditioning in the older part of John Marshall, I was led to believe that it was an impossible um, task and that it was cost prohibitive. So what has changed? So I would not qualify it as impossible. Um, it would not be easy, but given all the other factors, um, particularly where that school sits and the community or the part or the neighborhood that that serves, we don't have a lot of other really good options for where we could put those kids. You, it wouldn't work well to displace those kids to Hawthorne Hills or, or Franklin. That neighborhood is, you know, sort of landlocked. So are you thinking about not air conditioning the old part of the building? No, no. the entire school would be air conditioned. Okay, um, my next question has to do with capacity. When you're talking about 97% capacity at Statine and South Mountain, so then you're also talking about that's where development can take place, then are you looking at down the road in, in not too short of time that you're gonna be changing boundaries again because the, the school is so crowded? Unlikely. Uh, those two schools, that's why we added 60 students artificially to the South Mountain uh, school and we added 34 students to the Statine school and we're also talking about operational capacity so that gives us some additional wiggle room and also the applied populations lab out of UW-Madison suggests that overall our student enrollment in Wausau is going down. It's going down a lot of places in the state so we think we're building something that's the right size. We are including what's called one flex room at South Mountain and we're also including three flex rooms at Statine that haven't even been identified for whether they're going to be a kindergarten room or first grade, second or third or fourth. So we think we're building this the right size. We don't want to overbuild though at the same time. We don't want to spend tax money and overbuild and then the population growth never comes. So we, we think we found the sweet spot though for the size we need both those schools. Okay. now. Are we also then, with this, this new um, configuration, not allowing parents to have choice anymore if they wanted to go to a different elementary school? I will let Angie Lloyd uh, perhaps ask, answer I'll, that question. Or, and somebody else other than me might have a better answer for that question. Sure, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah, we, Teresa, we don't have choice schools anymore um, that went away quite a while ago. We do have in-district transfers and those, that would be for um, only reasons outlining our policy, which are very, very few. What do you see? Okay, and then my last question is, are we thinking about putting the peer program on-site at one of our elementary schools or are we still thinking about it being off-site? We are considering putting that on site at Franklin right now. We're considering putting Pier there. We're considering putting our Alt, alt High there and perhaps some other things at Franklin. All right, so we, we would be still using that building? Yes, I will warn against this and I have another spot to tell you this in the slideshow that some of the additional investments that we're talking about, including some alternative programming at Franklin and Montessori at Maine and Tom Field and School Forest, those are not budgeted yet. So the budget numbers you're gonna see, and I wanna remind people of this, they do not include repurposing of any of those buildings.
Hey Bob, this is Pat. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Right, two two questions. First, the just I want to make sure I got my numbers right here. So the overall capacity, the the net capacity change on the west side would be an increase of forty one, and on the east side an increase of a hundred. Did I have that right? I do not have those right in front of me, and my computer's being used to project right now. I can check on that. If you literally added these numbers up, I'm pretty confident. I'm very confident, 100% confident. They, if you added it right, the data is there. Uh, but that sounds sounds very right. Uh, but I don't have my access to all the data right now. So. Right, and then the second one, I guess, is just more of a clarification. I had a discussion today with a number of parents, and they asked. Would the, you said the 4K sites would remain at the existing schools? Correct. So, and, and I'm thinking about a student journey then, let's say from pre-K to high school, the way that this is proposed at least, and I know we're, we're talking about the middle school plan coming up. I mean, in theory, if I have a student not at a 4K elementary, but has to be you know transferred to a 4K, then they go to their elementary, then they would go to a 5-6, then they'd go to a 7-8. So in theory, they could have four different schools prior to high school. That is correct, including some of our partner sites too, our, our community 4K sites that would also happen for them. Okay. But I yes, just want to make sure I have that straight in my, my head anyways. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Should we move through the middle school plan and then we'll sure, ask for questions again? Yep. So if it's a K-4 merger, we need a solution for the fifth graders, and obviously sixth, seventh, and eighth. And the middle school solution, it does encourage perhaps more moving, but it also perhaps breaks down the river as a boundary. Uh, all fifth and sixth grade students would be attending an intermediate school located at John Muir and all 7th and 8th grade students would be attending a middle school at Horace Mann. So Mr. McKee's comments are correct. This could be bringing people from the far west side coming to an east side middle school and vice versa. Uh, at this moment, we do have a few more 7th and 8th graders than we do have 5th fifth fifth and 6th. Generally speaking, those numbers should be pretty close every year. This graph is not drawn to scale either. I think the difference between the two is only 57. So in recognition of that, we would build two schools that are about the same size. Not build, we would uh, remodel and maybe build onto two schools that are about the same size. A fifth, sixth grade school that has a capacity of 1209 and a seventh, eighth grade school that has a capacity also of 1209 these schools would be slightly different. Obviously, the needs of a fifth, sixth grader versus the needs of a seventh and eighth grader. So the schools wouldn't look exactly the same, but they do happen to have the same capacity on both east and west side. Uh, one of them happens to be over capacity by just a little bit. One of them happens to be under capacity by a little bit. Uh, if this plan is uh, move forward ultimately this over and under can almost be forgotten because capacities are going to change, or excuse me, enrollments are going to change in the next two or three years. Uh, so it's close. Uh, we also have word from Applied Populations Labs that the middle school enrollment should go down in the next five years. Here's a picture of John Muir. You're going to see the same data that you saw before. A bigger picture, bigger site, obviously. Some noteworthy changes with John Muir. Uh, traffic flow is an issue. Uh, we're always having challenges that deal with Stewart Avenue also happens to be a state highway. And our limitations for what we can do with exiting cars and buses out onto Stewart Avenue, this proposal includes a plan to get a, a back door, so to speak. Obviously, we wouldn't allow people to just cut the corner off and go through there whenever they want. We would have to control it somewhat but bus traffic in particular could be rerouted around the west side and to the north to 17th Ave. Uh, there are also some green spaces, a music addition, the main entry and some student services uh, areas, also some PE and some uh, swimming pool areas to the southwest and also receiving addition to the straight north. We would add some enrollment 
think about it this way, that John Muir currently houses one and a half grades because it's three grades cut in half. This would, this proposal would have it housing two grades. So the enrollment will go up a little bit. 96, the capacity will also go up a little bit and thus the need for the addition. Here's a picture of Horace Mann. Horace Mann, a little bit larger square footage, uh, bringing in quite a bit of enrollment from 750 all the way up to 1226. Keep in mind, Horace Mann has much smaller enrollment now than John Muir has. So if you took all 7th and 8th graders district wide, the enrollment at Horace Mann would go up. This plan also uh, has as one of its features the Montessori students would no longer be at Horace Mann, but the Montessori students would be in this particular case, Maine Elementary. So a small addition of square footage, uh, capacity would go up, enrollment would go way up because Horace Mann has Montessori in it right now. So this is a 7-8 proposed enrollment. Here are the budget numbers for the middle schools. Uh, the deferred maintenance, in other words, all the white spaces or many of the white spaces would receive deferred maintenance investments, modernization, uh, bringing it up to a certain standard that we would want to achieve district-wide in the name of equity. Deferred maintenance, $11 million in these two schools. The remodels and additions, obviously larger at John Muir. You saw the addition at Horace Mann was quite small, $20 million in remodels and additions. Uh, for a $31.6 million, $31 million price tag for the middle schools. If you add that to the elementary investment, this is about an $85 million bond issue for the elementary K-4 merger and the corresponding middle school 6-7 or 5-6-7-8 plan. This is an interesting chart with a lot of data on it and you may not be able to digest all of it right now. Uh, up top in green, the aggregate of all of the additional space, additional uh, capacity, we would be losing square footage, merging some buildings, choosing not to invest in some buildings. Uh, the current capacity, uh, of ignoring our high schools obviously of 5691 would go down a little bit, thus allowing us to be more efficient uh, or more efficiently use the space that we do have. It would be more full, and we will also recognize that enrollment statewide and in the Wassa area may be going down a little bit over the next few years. In the next chart, you see three columns. The first column uh, represents non-recurring or one-time, maybe this year, next year, the following year, deferred maintenance cost avoidance at each one of those schools. The first one we'll use as an example, if we no longer chose to invest in Grant Elementary, about $5.3 million of investments would not need to be made. Now some of that is in our current budget. Some of it is part of our capital budget that we have every year, million dollars district wide, but some of it obviously wouldn't be through our normal annual budget. It would be through a referendum. If we wanted to bring Thomas Jefferson, or excuse me, Grant, up to the standards that we're suggesting for the rest of our elementary schools, it would cost $5.3 million. If we choose to not invest in grant and perhaps merge into another school, that's $5.3 million of savings. On the far right, modernization cost avoidance, that's not deferred maintenance, but just bringing it up to a modern day standard, grant has a pretty large number. Uh, AC might be in that one. Uh, Separate cafeteria and gymnasium might be in that one. Obviously lighting, things like that. Modernization, $6.5 million investment that we would not need to make if we chose not to invest in Grant Elementary anymore. The middle column is recurring on an annual basis. Red up top are schools that we're choosing not to invest in. Green are schools that we're adding on to. The red numbers are cost savings that we would not have in our annual budget if any one of those schools were merged into the bottom ones in green. <coughs> it essentially takes a current <coughs> cost for any one of those schools and wipes it out to zero. For example, in Grant Elementary, there's a recurring annual cost of $2.9 million each year. If we got rid of that entire investment, obviously 
much of that would pop up in the green below. Dr. Hiltz mentioned before, people aren't losing their jobs. Much of this is staffing. So if you see staffing savings on the bottom of $2.5 million, it's important to understand that's a theoretical number that may not be achieved for a few years. Or it also represents a number that we could reinvest. Dr. Hiltz mentioned how we don't leverage our current student-teacher ratio like we could. That's money that we can reinvest in more uh, efficiently using the favorable student-teacher ratio or student-staff ratio. So up top, numbers, uh, uh, values that are uh, no longer needed in our annual budget, and the green would be additional numbers that we would need in our annual budget. The net, $2.5 million of annual savings, efficiencies achieved by this plan that we can invest in all kinds of things, many of which Dr. Hiltz mentioned earlier. The Applied Populations Lab out of UW-Madison did some research for us, and in that research, they found some things that I already mentioned. Uh, the enrollment over time in Wausau will be declining. Uh, the second one, uh, the Wausau area is growing gradually older and older and having fewer children, although there is an increase in housing developments, especially to our far west. Uh, also, the biggest decline is expected in our middle school grades over the next several years, five years. Uh, elementary students are projected to decline as well, but not as great as the middle schools, and high schools are actually going to see an increase in enrollment for a few years. It was comforting to know that when we hired uh, or contracted with a uh, applied population, they came up with very similar numbers that we already had. Our enrollment projections were very close to what uh, applied populations lab came up with. And if you're thinking Wausau School District is the only school district experiencing declining enrollment, here's a map of the state of Wisconsin. The purple to different degrees, dark purple, light purple represent declining enrollment. Dark is a bigger decline. Green are, are increasing enrollment. So you will see much of the state is in declining enrollment. Many parts of northern Wisconsin are declining at a much more rapid pace than the Wausau School District also. Some other areas that we are looking to invest. I will say that none of this is included already in the $85 million bond issue that I mentioned. That's an estimate, obviously. But we're also looking to make improvements at the school forest, and most notably the new environmental learning center. We're hopefully going to be able to invest some referendum money there, also with some private donations uh, that are coming through the Wausau School Foundation. Montessori expansion and permanent location. Uh, expansion to 4K8? Correct, yes. 4K8, and the location for now is, <coughs> has, has been decided as Main Elementary, but of course this is a plan. Uh, growth in wave, increasing wave to a grade level. K-12. K-12 also. Uh, alternative education, which includes our Alt High and our peer program, as well as any other alternative education perhaps even a wave. Uh, we are looking to put that in Franklin. That would take an investment as well. <coughs> Athletic field improvements. There are some improvements needed at both East and West High School. There are also improvements needed at Tom Field. Tom Field has been somewhat neglected for the last several years. It does not have field turf. Most in our area do. Obviously safety and security improvements. Larry Seiler mentioned that earlier. Deferred maintenance at the high schools. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about the high schools tonight, but the high schools are due for some deferred maintenance and some modernization. And then, of course, modernized life safety systems. And life safety systems, generally speaking, refer to communication. Uh, if we start adding up all of these things, obviously we're now beyond $85 million. We've been in the midst of a strategy for the last three years called defeasance. And defeasance essentially refers to making your house payment in advance. We are taking all of the debt that we are paying, paying off from previous referenda and we're prepaying some of that debt while keeping the mill rate in decline in the last three or four years and we're prepaying debt and we're in a position to borrow money through bond issue for all of these things on this screen 
and all of the things that I mentioned earlier and have our mill rate go down. So our mill rate going down suggests the affordability time is right. And everything that Dr. Hiltz mentioned earlier and I added to suggests that the need is right. And when need meets affordability, that makes for a good referendum question. And if you need a reminder what the mill rate has looked like over the last 10 years while passing a referendum, while engaged in some deferred maintenance improvements and energy efficiency improvements, our mill rate, uh, we've been very responsible with that and with a mind on the taxpayer and it's been very flat and it's actually been going down over the last three or four years. So we have been very responsible with past referenda and under this plan we would certainly do that in the future. That brings us to another opportunity for some questions. Mm -hmm. I have some. So I don't know if I should unmute. I can. Or can people hear me through that computer? I will mute myself so we won't get feedback. And you can unmute. Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Bob. So we heard that Franklin is potentially designated to be a site for alternative um, high school, Maine for Montessori, but what about Hewitt, Texas, Red Mountain, Grant, and Lincoln? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get, sure. right now everybody's looking at a black screen. Oh, okay. okay. Sure. The plan as of now, Maine repurposed as a Montessori, Franklin repurposed as alternative education, let's just call it to be all encompassing. Sure. Uh, Lincoln, no current plans for Lincoln but we know it has close proximity to the mob. There's some good things about that. Mm -hmm. No current plans for Grant, and no current plans for Hewitt, Texas. And what does that leave me? Red Mountain. Red Mountain, no current plans for you. We can pursue putting them on the market, all kinds of things, if we if this gets legs and it keeps moving forward. We, we just didn't invest much in what we're gonna do with those buildings right. at this point. Okay, mm -hmm. I did receive this question from a number of community mm -hmm. members today. Yeah. Do other board members have questions? I do. Somebody, somebody here needs some you. That was me, okay. All right. Am I on? Yeah. Okay, so, so my question is, is about curriculum for uh, the fifth grade. Um, how different is the, uh, the current fifth grade um, structure with the teams from what would go on during in a middle school program? Those seem relatively similar to me. I can, can I respond? I can start by answering that, Jeff. We had that discussion actually today, and I, I can't say that we have a definitive answer for you right now, but the discussion was that um, in, in middle schools that I've known that say have been like a 5-8 concept, a lot of times the, the fifth grade is, is still kind of kept in one area of the building. Uh, they rotate uh, among a group of teachers throughout the day, um, and, and so they're kind of offset a little bit. Uh, but Larry and and Pat and Rob and I had that discussion today and said that there are different ways that we could organize that, uh, but that would have to still kind of be fleshed out as we move forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is Lisa Miles. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering how many families are going to be involved in a boundary, if there's going to be boundary changes, how many families are going to be impacted with another change? I don't think we know that. We don't know that. We can start by, if we consider buildings that we're no longer investing in, uh, some students would be aging out of that school. Uh, some will not yet be at that school. Some will be in that school when the move would occur. And obviously it would start with that number of families. And from there, boundaries aren't gonna be uh, consistent with what the boundaries are right now. It's probably impossible to have that happen. So that could add a few more families. Well, that just seems to be, um, Bob, a question that a lot of families have is, are we gonna have to change again? And 
going to impact, I think, how they would see the referendum. Yes, absolutely. And we're crossing this bridge first, and we're going to cross a lot more bridges before we're done with this. And, and we just don't want to invest in finding that exact number and finding exact numbers for a lot of this before we know it meets at least enough approval from the board to move to that next step. So those are numbers we're certainly going to have to find out. Lance has a question. Go ahead, Lance. Yes, so one of the um, concerns that I heard today was regarding class sizes. Um, heard from numerous people that were worried that the consolidation would somehow increase our class sizes, which is not my understanding, but um, do you want to maybe touch on that, Keith or somebody else? Yeah, I, I, I could, could uh, speak, speak to, to it. it. One second, I'll get to it. And then uh, Mrs. Sheridan may have uh, more detail. Um, our, our expectation, as you saw some of the data that Mr. Tess showed, we have a favorable student-teacher ratio, meaning we have fewer students per teacher, per staff member than most districts our size. We would expect that through creating these, uh, the, the, these seven elementaries that our class sizes uh, would be the same or lower uh, than what we have now. Um, so I'm going to see if uh, Mrs. Sheridan might have more to add to that. Sorry, wait, Andrea, one second. Grade students moving out of yeah. our existing elementary schools immediately. That makes for some additional classroom space available um, to be able to equalize our grade levels. We'd also be anticipating um, potentially somewhere between three to five sections per grade, depending on if it's an AGR or non-AGR school. So yes, our goal would be to equalize not only within an elementary building, but across the seven buildings as well. Okay, I have a question. Okay, another uh, question that I have kind of off of what Pat was saying earlier is anticipating students in multiple grade levels and multiple buildings. I heard concerns today from parents about hardship, um, traveling across town which they wouldn't have to do currently and also start times i mean if you imagine somebody that's in fourth grade uh, has a fourth grader has a sixth grader has an eighth grader has a tenth grader um i'm assuming start times are going to be taken into account right can i speak to that yes please all right um good questions and and some some of those things that we've considered um i think um what i might do at this point is maybe, because I think there's a lot of questions about that middle school uh, framework, perhaps Mr. Weber or uh, Dr. Phelps or Mr. Mansell might want to speak to you know, uh, a number of the, the, the factors that you're already considering regarding this middle school concept. I know we've talked about the number of transitions. You've talked a little bit about you know, that developmental, uh, developmentally appropriate school setting. Um, would one or the three of you kind of speak to the work that you've done to date, realizing that if what we're waiting for tonight really is the board to say, yes, we like the framework, and if you say that, we will begin to create teams that will flesh out a lot of these questions. But if one or you three could, um, could speak to that. Absolutely. I'll start, and then I know um, Larry and Rob would uh, like to say a few things as well. But, you know, we had a lot of discussion over the last well, several months uh, around this topic and um, when we kind of sort of boil it all down there we do really find some value in separating schools five and six and seven and eight um, for one thing there would be no more boundary issues which would allow the rebalancing of staff and resources uh, within within the, the two buildings uh, so it would help with the overcapacity at John Beer, which would be a huge burden off the administration and staff. And then at uh, Forest Man, where they're genuinely concerned about uh, reductions due to enrollment, that would help balance their staff as well. And so there would be benefits from that end at both schools. Uh, there's also some benefits teaching-wise where we would get uh, common teachers working together. So for example, you would have all seven eighth grade social studies teaching together. So if we're looking at that guaranteeing viable curriculum, you know, I think that's important that we, we will be able to have a true team, a true department uh, in one school. Uh, also, uh, we'll have at both 
hospital services team, and they focus on a two-year time period. So you can take those students who have a, sort of a life that, that life time period and engage uh, in some of the same problems and issues that may arise developmentally during that time, and they can focus just on that area. Uh, fiscally, it supports the elementary plan, uh, merging the schools by bringing that fifth grade up so that that would assist in that area. And uh, we would also be able to uh, maintain and re reestablish the middle school concept, which I think is very important. I, and I know that uh, Dr. Phelps, Mr. Mance will be speaking to that in a moment. And it, there is very strong support for that middle school concept, not only among the staff and families as well. Also, uh, there are some drawbacks. You know, and like with anything, Daniel Burst brought one up is the, is the transportation and the transition. So those would definitely have to be studied. Uh, the fourth to fifth grade transition would probably be the most difficult for the students. Uh, you're bringing kids together from numerous schools. So uh, it would be similar to the fifth to sixth grade transition right now. So it might be the most difficult of the transitions. The sixth to seventh probably would uh, not be as difficult because they're all together for two years and then they move on together. Uh, but it would be a focus and something that we would have to plan and, and be prepared for and maybe uh, you know put a little bit of extra to, uh, professional development into how do we transition to uh, kids effectively between schools and uh, you know the transportation issue as well you know, there would be some extended bus rides from students so we would have to maybe look at that uh, would we be able to have some uh, you know direct uh, direct routes right from one side of the river to the other or how are we that for some of the students with a longer ride. Um, we also talked about uh, you know engaging Metro and first student obviously in this discussion but what about you know looking at Wi-Fi on buses for students uh, for these longer maybe these longer rides and you know, these are different things that you have to look at you talked about uh, definitely uh, doable but also uh, we understand it would be a concern. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Phelps Mr. Bansell to discuss a little bit about the middle school concept that they're excited to, to reestablish. All right, are we good with me talking? Perfect. All right, so um, I taught at John Muir for 10 years, uh, math on Team 72, and saw firsthand what the middle school concept did with our students. Uh, the past seven years as a horse man administrator, uh, seeing that continue and be successful in learning. At the same time, it's been kind of painful to see colleagues from across the river and their challenges in a building with 300 plus students, um, 300 plus more students than Horace Mann. And one of those challenges that John Muir has faced is maintaining the middle school concept. Um, they've had to go away from a teaming approach. They're doing the best that they can, but the challenges are definitely real. Um, so we're here tonight to just quickly go over what that middle school concept is, a reminder of that and advocate that the middle school concept be used at each of the proposed buildings. And frankly, no matter what the future holds, we advocate that we find some way to keep, to get back to what our staff, students, and families agree is best for our kids in the middle, and that is the middle school concept. Um, so just a couple of points about the middle school concept. Um, it is a team approach where a small group of teachers work with a smaller group of students. So for an example, with our district, 600 or so sixth grade students, uh, we would place them in approximately 150 student teams with six teaching staff for the majority of their school day. Um, that's kind of like a school within a school, and it fosters a consistent, strong, and trusting relationship between students and our staff. Uh, the team, including administration and student services, would focus on not only academics, but an emphasis on the whole child. Team meetings in the middle school concept focus on students' social emotional well-being, uh, what the team can do to support our kids. And when I really truly think about the middle school concept, it's our teams making a personal and differentiated learning plan for each student. Um, so many of these pose a challenge without a team approach. Uh, the middle school concept also gives a strong sense of belonging. Teams work together in thematic or integrated units, providing opportunities to reinforce certain topics in multiple different areas. Teams also go on field trips together, have team activities, uh, compete against other teams in dress up days, which are very fun, uh, provide incentives for team accomplishments, and the list really goes on and on. So again, our middle schools now and whatever they look like in the future 
need to include the middle school concept. Um, so that I think is a clear thing that we all agree on, our students, our staff, and our families. Thank you. Everybody hear me? Uh, first of all, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk a little bit about 5, 6, and 7, 8 concept, as well as the middle school concept. I just want to echo a lot of what Dr. Phelps has said about the middle school concept, because uh, for the last 12 years, being at John Muir, when I first arrived in 2008, we actually had nine teams, three at each of the grade levels. And I've seen that over the course of the last 12 years due to, um, first of all, declining enrollment, and then again, increased enrollment. I've seen the erosion of the middle school concept in order for us to be able to provide the programming that we needed and still be able to balance class sizes. Um, we started with eliminating uh, teams at we're reducing the number of teams at seventh grade, and then followed with eighth grade, and then this past year uh, with sixth grade. And with that has come a lot of challenges, um, just in terms of how do we organize the physical structure of the building and still try to maintain as, as much of that relationship building with students as possible. Um, I can't tell you enough how hard our staff have worked, especially our pupil services team, to consistently maintain those relationships with kids. We know that the most critical thing, especially um, in those middle years, to have someone that you can reach out to, to have someone that you can trust in. I just want to reinforce also that having the schools within a school creates kind of a family atmosphere um, and that's something that is really important not only for our staff um, it's important for students and it's important for our community families as well we're really excited about the possibilities uh, that that intermediate five six can offer as well as uh, the seven eight concept <coughs> what that curriculum <coughs> would look like would certainly gain lots of efficiencies and I think, Lance, you, you brought up class sizes. Right now, John Muir has some very ugly numbers. And I say ugly numbers because they're ugly numbers on the very large side. Um, we're at the point where you have to decide, are you going to have four sections that are at 32, or are you going to have five sections that are at um, 24 or 23, when your FTE is limited? Horace Mann is right now on the, um, also has ugly numbers, but they're on the low side, where they still have to offer the same programming. Um, but their class sizes may be smaller, but they still need to offer it. So we can gain lots of efficiencies and balance a lot of those class size issues that we're talking about by having that 5, 6, and 7, 8. We're going to gain tremendous efficiencies that way. And we're we are really going to be able to leverage the skill sets of our staff in meeting the, the needs of students. Well, thank you. Um, I do have a comment. Okay. 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 So, so, oh, sorry. You're fine. Okay. so, um, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding what you need from the board because we could get into the weeds but what I'm also hearing is that you just need some direction from the board and I want to be clear that what what was stated at the start of this meeting tonight uh, is that if there were any changes and that assumes the board approves something and then also the public approves it those changes wouldn't occur until fall 2023 correct um, I received a lot of emails today from individuals that are concerned that fall of 2020 will be changes and that's not the case mm -hmm. so we just need to be very clear about that um, and then there was also some concern about the fact that we're even having this discussion at this time given the fact that we are in the midst of a global pandemic 
but uh, this discussion started before this global pandemic hit, and I want to point that out. And I think the other important thing to point out is the fact that November 2020 is going to have a higher um, amount of public participation. And that is uh, a factor here as well, because um, something that is important is we, if, if we want to move forward with something, we want to hear from the most um, amount of the public. And that's going to be November 2020 as opposed to an April um, election and referendum. And that is if we even do anything. But that's why we are still continuing on with this discussion at this time. Uh, so, are there other board member questions for the administration? I'm assuming there will be quite a few yet. I don't see. Teresa has her hand up, but I think it might be from before. Teresa, did you have a question? Am I on? All right. I, I'm concerned about a couple things. Um, I know that Dr. Hiltz had a lot of groups that he got to know when he first came. But as I look through all the emails that got sent to us today, there are a lot of parents that were totally unaware of some of the things we were thinking of doing. And um, I think we have to go back to these people and have focus groups and find out what they would also support because I got the feeling that many of them really still, and we also know this historically, they like their neighborhood schools. And I think that there's so much education that needs to go um, to these groups about why this would be better for their children. And at this point, I don't, I don't think they're there. And so um, that kind of bothers me. And the other thing is we, we have schools like Satine and South Mountain and Riverview that are going to have a certain class of kids. And they're not going to have as many kids that are um, in the poverty level and it seems like and this was an email that was sent to us today is that we're creating some super schools where they're not going to have the the low income needs of many of our children that we're putting in schools and and like thinking of jd jones and um uh, thomas jefferson that, and hawthorne hills that we're really giving them an enormous amount of children that need lots and lots of help. And it seems like, again, we're not being fair. So those are just things that I've been seeing on my email today mm -hmm. that are concerns, and they're concerns of mine too. Okay, so I'll do a second. Sure. Okay. All right, thanks, Teresa. Um, yes, we did receive a number of emails today. Uh, I spent uh, several hours replying to those, and I'm very glad that we have heard from um, the individuals we heard from. By and large, it did seem to be one school that we were hearing from. Um, and I think it's important to remember that we are not voting on anything tonight. This is just a discussion and essentially approving uh, moving forward with more information gathering. Yes. Um, so I, I think that's in line with what your concerns are. And um, depending on where we go tonight, I would ask that Dr. Hiltz and the, um, your administration um, compose something that would be distributed to um, parents and, and potentially posted on the website just to clarify um, what happened tonight and what the next steps are. Because we certainly aren't taking any action. We're not voting on anything. This is just um, really exploratory right now. Yes. Webster has something. All right, Lee. I have a question. I, this has been one that's been raised a few times to and that is we're looking at everything from A through the school, but we have to address the high school issue. And uh, where are we at special thing? It's his internet. Lee has a bad connection. Can yeah. we get a repetition of that? If we could hear it. Yeah. We uh, could uh, not hear it uh, either. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, it seems to be a connection on Lee's end because we had trouble hearing that over here as well. 
Lee, do you want to try again, please? Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Better. 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 Okay. Okay. Better. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Okay, the question is that we haven't really discussed anything about the high school issues. And that's come up a number of times. I'm just curious what we what think the market in that regard. Okay. Ready. Thanks for asking, Lee. Yeah, we've had a, a number of conversations about the high school. Um, and frankly, um, you know, if if the community and the board wanted us to move forward with a K-12 plan, we could we could do that. Frankly, in our conversations, we think about the scope of reinventing our K-8 educational system as an enormous undertaking uh, and very and critically important. And so we wanted to do two things: one, um, you know, focus on that work, and two help create a project that the, the, the community could you know, wrap its head around and, and, and support. Um, we think that the, the complexity of the high schools uh, really is uh, warrants perhaps a, a second project, um, but we do have some plans that are in, in the development phase. And again, if the board and the community want us to, to pursue a K-12 plan, we could certainly do that. Okay, so uh, Keith, if we were to say this is something that we are interested in more information about, is it something that you come back with more information and there's parts that the board is supportive of, parts that the board is not, and we can continue from there? Uh, I certainly don't want you to undertake enormous efforts into something that ends up being futile on your end. Yeah, what we're looking for tonight uh, is is the go-ahead permission from the board to continue to do some research and development. Um, if the board says we're in favor of the concept, we've got a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, we would do two things. One, we would begin to communicate with staff and the community, as, as Mrs. Miles had pointed out, and we would form some, uh, engage some more teams of parents, teachers, administrators, to start to flesh out these these concepts and answer some of these pressing questions. Okay, okay so just to reiterate, uh, again, we're not voting on anything. This is just moving forward, um, giving some approval that uh, we recognize there are inefficiencies in the district and that we want to uh, continue to pursue advancing <coughs> student um, learning achievement and success which is the goal of the or the mission statement of the Wausau School District and this is a way in which we can do this um, so we would not be voting on anything but do, does anybody have any concerns as it relates to allowing Dr. Hiltz and the administration to move forward with further research on this potential referendum proposal. And public conversation. And public conversation. Okay, I need you to mute. Okay. Alright. Who is it? Teresa still has her hand up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's from before. Uh, Lance has something. Okay. Do you just want to call on him? Okay. Lance, can you go ahead with your question please? Yeah, I guess the the concern that I would have would be um, if the safe for home order continues and we're not able to go forward with the public information steps. Um, so I suppose that's my concern. That isn't a concern that would cause me tonight to say don't try, don't, don't plan on something. Um, but I know that I wouldn't be in favor of voting on something in August to go to a referendum in November if we miss out on that public information phase of it. Um, and it would, the vote would fail anyway if we skipped that part of the process. So I think it makes sense to start thinking about it and start making those plans, but I just think we have to be realistic and know mm -hmm. that, you know, if things don't change in time, uh, we may have no, no choice but to wait longer. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. That would be a reason to keep yeah. it up. Yeah. Okay, Jim, you're up next. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Yes. Am I being heard? So I... Yes, you, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I really would like to echo what uh, uh, Lance just said, along with that, and I would only give this bit of advice based on a number of people that uh, have been in contact with me and all, all of you. Uh, many people, and I think Teresa probably hit it on the head, many people thought they were blindsided by this, and I, I, I would like the administrative team to take a look at every communicative way of getting information out so that the community knows that they're being communicated. That's all I want to say. Okay, so I have a... Oh, you have some... Yeah, I just... Because Lance didn't hear us. All right, go ahead. Okay, I just want to follow up with Lance's comment and now Jim's because uh, Dr. Hiltz and I were nodding our heads here, but in case that didn't convey, obviously we would not move forward without extensive public comment. As of now, Governor Evers' Safer at Home order extends through um, towards the end of May. So uh, we are operating under the assumption that it's not going to be extended. But of course, if it is, we will just have to change plans accordingly and modify. But the, the risk would be if we, if we speculate and don't move forward because of that potential risk, we could be losing an opportunity um, that could have a, a detrimental impl implications for our students if we um, see that we have some wonderful opportunities here and, and don't do anything right now. But of course, public comment, public input, and staff input is huge. It's yeah. decisive here. We can't move forward. We can't it. move forward without it. So that's, a, of course, um, critical. Okay, next we have Pat McKee. I guess, Keith, just a, I guess, a, a request. Um, maybe more than, than anything. And first of all, you know, I really appreciate the detail that you guys went through tonight. There was obviously a lot of time um, spent gathering all of this information. Um, two things really. Number one, I think it's going to help the communication process if we can further crystallize exactly what the objectives are in terms of some tangible takeaways. And then secondly to that, what are the potential alternatives? As an example, one of the objectives, we know that there's imbalances between uh, Horseman and John Muir, for example. So what you guys have laid out tonight is one way to go about addressing that imbalance. Are there other options for that? Regardless of, of cost or implications, I, just, I think that people appreciate when they see that we recognize a problem and an opportunity for improvement, if we can provide more than one way to get at that, at least we you know, are, I, I think we're providing choice um, if we do anything at the end of the day. I, I think that providing some options is important to people, right? And the, the same can be said for, um, you know, the, the schools that are, that you guys presented tonight, you know, that, that could potentially um, be merged with others, right? So we know that we have an efficiency issue with our, classrooms with our buildings. Is there another way to get at that and still um, achieve some or all of the, you know, the objectives? So I, I know it's easier said than done, but that would be my, my two ask there. Okay. Anybody else? Did, did you want to say something to him, Keith? Yeah, I can speak to that. Sorry, I was making a note here. He gave a thumbs up. Are there more questions? Uh, just pants was pending. it's muted so right are there more questions I, I mean I, I, I I'm gonna speak to that maybe in a summary statement okay yeah um, Teresa still has her hand up and so does Jim Boucher yeah. I'm gonna call on them Cassie sure. go ahead Teresa and Jim do you either of you have questions Jim does not okay no I I've said all I care to say and I thank everyone for their work. Thank you. Are we ready to summarize? Yeah. Cassie, on my, could you pull up my presentation again and go to a summary? There's a summary of the project. Yes. Um, 
you know what slide it is? Just keep go forward. Um, one, two, right, back up one. Right. One more back. Here we go. Sorry, right there. Just a second. Let me get back, and I got to share. Oh, okay. We got you. <clears throat> okay. You're good. Good. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for your questions. Um, in response to Mr. McKee's question, I, I did have a, a summary, a concrete summary of the proposed referendum project uh, listed here. Um, you can see, again, just to summarize, remodel and merge our, our elementaries into seven schools serving K-4 students, uh, create a five, six intermediate school, a seven, eight inter, uh, middle school, uh, develop a 4K, eight Montessori school, likely out at Maine, bring all of our alternative pro, uh, programs together to support each other, likely at that Franklin site, um, build the new environmental learning center in conjunction with the Wausau School Foundation to enhance that gem of our district, that school forest, and again, remodel Tom Field and address some of those deferred maintenance and technology replacements. If we get down to the, the nuts and bolts of it, that's the, that's the referendum proposal. Mm -hmm. Could you go forward one more? Um, as I started in the beginning, uh, we started with our foundation, our mission and our shared key interests. I revisit those shared key interests to show that this plan, uh, if it doesn't address that shared key interest and advance it specifically, it will do it, uh, offer those opportunities to, to uh, uh, advance those interests once this project would be completed. Next slide, I think is the... Here's a little bit of that uh, timeline that people have, have talked about. And it's very, very loose. It's just a general, really what it's about is now communication. I am, I am glad to be having this conversation in public finally. Uh, I'm, I'm anxious to talk to staff and community members and, and flesh this. Uh, there's just so much distillation that comes through the, the, the process of conversation and exploration. So this is a, a, a rough, rough timeline of, of what would be happening. But again, it'd be bringing people together, staff, community, to flesh out these ideas and, and obviously start communicating. And I think the next slide is the last one. Yeah. And, and this is really the, the question I ask. Um, you know, if we can support the whole child, um, what can we do together? And I, I guess my closing statements would be that you know I've been listening to staff and parents and community requests to make changes for two years and many administrators and staff members and board members have been hearing it longer than that and while I really enjoy the conversation and I'm always willing to listen I'm really I really want to take action to make change so that's what we're proposing tonight um, and so if the board is willing, then we would uh, move forward as we talked about to um, develop some teams, continue this research and development into the concept and start to um, share information uh, broadly through multi, uh, you know, through, through many modes of communication um, and, and, and start to help people understand this project. And I think I would end with our mission Let's advance student learning, achievement, and success. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Um, I have a comment then. All right. Yep. And first student stuff, too. Right. Um, okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Hiltz. I do want to remind this board that we did a, an evaluation last summer, and one of the things that we asked was, uh, we said we want to see um, bold action. And I think that you brought that to us. Uh, Dr. Hiltz, and these are addressing things that have needed to be addressed for long before you arrived here. So I want to thank you for the work that you put in. You put in countless hours with the sessions, the ideation sessions, listening to parents, community members, and staff. And um, there are we, we recognize that things need to change. Uh, and so this, again, is not saying that we are having a referendum, but we're saying we're exploring possibility. And I can say that I am in support of um, furthering that exploration at this time. Uh, and I guess I would ask if there are board members who would like to vocalize that they are not in support.
Do you see any hands? I don't. Okay. Uh, Teresa. Oh, okay. Teresa. 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 Can you prompt her, Cassie? Yeah. Thank you. Trish, did you ask me a question? Go ahead. I think her hand was up, but maybe it was from before. Go ahead, Teresa. Um, I just thought that um, Krista asked me a question. I wasn't quite clear. I think her hand was, was up from before. She asked me to comment on her no. um, going forward? No. Uh, Teresa, your hand was still up in the participant oh, list, so well, that's why... I, I, I think that's a mistake. Okay, okay. So, um, I'll unmute. Okay, so hearing none, I think that um, if we can continue forward in this, um, my only question though is I am very concerned about that May date you have listed as far as communication. Um, we can see that communication is likely going to be going out um, sooner than that. Is there something that you or perhaps Amy uh, will get out much sooner as it relates to communication regarding tonight's meeting so that there isn't an erroneous understanding of what is occurring tonight. Yes. <laughs> you want me to respond to that? Please. <laughs> yes, we can. We will start, um, you know, with broad communication uh, um, soon. You know, like you said, you know, when I was originally planning this, um, we were thinking May, but you know, certainly we, we, you know, I think this really starts the communication right now. You know, in terms of this meeting. But yes, we have we can create uh, you know uh, informational pieces to go out, um, and, and just a, a quick note about the research and development. I agree with Mr. McKee that you know people are wondering how else might this be done, and so certainly part of that research and development will be to look for uh, potential alternatives to the same outcomes. So mm -hmm. yes, agreed. Okay, I'm gonna unmute. Okay, I'm not hearing any um, vocalization. Uh, of concerns besides what was already addressed uh, so uh, thank you for your work on this and we look forward to um, the next step that you will bring back to this board uh, during this time the uh, Bob actually received communication as it relates to agenda item 2 student transportation contract amendment so board members we are actually going to go back to that and I believe that this is an action item then tonight okay I'm gonna turn it over to Bob you on mic on mic okay there you go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, in anticipation this might happen, I we did notice the meeting to include this action, and I actually included a memo in your board packet uh, that I was hopeful first student would agree to by the time we got to this point. And I got a text during the meeting, early in the meeting. Uh, there was no news, but since then they said, go ahead with that memo that you have prepared. So 10, day, ten days ago I was proposing approximately 82% of the non-transport days paying for a student. First student would miss out on all their extracurricular busing, they would miss out on all the field trip busing, but we'd pay them about 82% of their typical home to school uh, costs for the rest of the school year. The board 10 days ago asked me to go back and see what they could do. We have a budget year this year that's pretty stable, but future years, anything but stable. We don't know what's gonna happen in future years. So first student worked with me, and I might add that all along, first student is helping us with our hygiene bus and helping us with food delivery and things like that, and they didn't flinch. Uh, they continue to uh, provide that service all along. But here's what uh, the agreement that we came to pending your approval, of course. Rather than the $15,000 a day for the rest of the school year, uh, they would like $15,000, which is again about 82% of their revenue for home to school only. $15,000 per day for 19 of the days that we've already missed, and only $10,000 a day for all the days that we would miss going forward from April 17th, and into subsequent budget years. So in other words, next year, if something similar like this happens, we don't have to come back and amend the contract, that $10,000 smaller rate prevails. As a matter of fact, under this proposal, it would pre uh, prevail for not only next four years, but an additional fifth year of the contract. So we would essentially create a new five-year contract. Also, in the current five-year contract, 
we're under annual escalator amounts of 3%, 3%, 3%, 3%, uh, ending in four more years. This new proposal would achieve 2%, 2%, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. Uh, so it would extend the contract one more year. Uh, pretty mutually beneficial that, it, uh, that would be. We would have smaller percent escalators for each year, and they would be able to uh, recognize some of the revenue that they're missing out on by only having three quarters of a school year. Again, 10, 10 days ago, I talked about how the first three quarters of the school year, they really don't get out of the red. They get out of the red and into the black during that last quarter of the school year, including all the extracurricular trips. This year, they never had that opportunity. So you have some of this in writing. You also have a motion that I wrote that I would like for you to consider. And with that, that's the end of my prepared statements. Perhaps you have questions. Uh, Bob, while we wait for board member questions, where's that revised motion? I have the motion from April 13th. <laughs> <coughs> there should be a motion in board book tonight, tonight's okay. board book meeting, okay. and I can read it. If I think I can find it. Are there board questions? Uh, no one has raised their hand. Oh, I do not see a motion here. Should we get this one? It's the black. The one on the bottom. Okay. Black on the bottom. So this is a pretty detailed one. Jeff had Jeff a question. Lee is questioning something right now. Jeff Lee's talking, so yep. we'll, we'll I'll mute Jeff. mine. We'll turn the speaker on. Okay, am I good to go? Yeah. Okay, given all the knowables, in other words, let's say there is no stay at safer at home order next year or, or the preceding years of the contract, what's the dollar difference between um, this proposal and the last one. I am going to mute. Okay, go ahead. The last proposal offered about $765,000 for this year, and it had nothing to do, it didn't reference future years. This one represents $605 for this year, and it does recognize some savings in future years. Actually, next year, depending on how many days there are, there, there's no transportation. That's the big wild card. If there are a lot of days where there's no transportation, the number changes considerably. Okay, well Bob, just given the, let, you know, again, let's leave that part out of it, but given the percentage increases, with the two and the 2.5 versus the three, what's the dollar savings there? If we just, if we just talk about the percent changes, that's $288,000 over the four years that remain in the contract. The fifth year I didn't cost because there's not a comparison to number, but it would be over $100,000 if we had a sixth year that was 3% just for that sixth year. So it's tough to talk about that comparison in the sixth year because it's compared to what? We don't have a contract for the sixth year. It's certainly a savings over budget, a savings over budget because we're budgeting for a full school year. So it's certainly a savings over budget. We pay $10,000 per day that we don't have transportation versus probably fifteen dollars or $16,000, certainly in the latter part of the term. And then we save on fuel. We also save on uh, extracurriculars and some, uh, some of that stuff. So it's certainly a savings over budget. But this is a more generous contract than what we're in the middle of right now. We talked about that 10 days ago, because right now there is no provision to recapture some lost revenue on days that we don't have school. Are you muted? Are there other board questions? No, I don't. Okay, I'm gonna unmute. Right, so, 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 so given what you've told us with everything that, that's possibly knowable about this point, it comes to a $453,000 improvement over the last proposal. I'm gonna take that. Bear with me one second. He's still talking. 
Mm -hmm. Is he still talking? I can't tell. Not anymore. No. Okay. Uh, the last proposal didn't recognize anything in the subsequent years. It was only 765 versus 605, a savings about of $150,000. But in addition to that, the next four years, we saved about $288,000 off of the current contract. And the sixth year, or five years from now, it's hard to tell, we could easily add another $100,000 there. But keep in mind, important to understand, this proposal is more expensive than our current contract because our current contract does not have a recognition in there for days that aren't transported. And that's what started this whole conversation. Very similar what we're doing here to what school districts all across Wisconsin are doing. Lance has a question. Do you want to call on him? Lance, you have a question. Can you meet yourself? Yep. Yeah, that was going to be my question. Um, is if we're now adding the protection over the course of the next four or five years to have payment on days where the buses don't run, I'm assuming that's things like snow days? Okay. Yes, snow days would be included. This year, but what would be a typical year on average? Um, you know, what would that dollar amount, I'm sure you looked at it, what would be the, the average year that we'd be paying more for um, these protection days? The numbers that I stated a second ago actually include four snow days, four days without transport for each of the next four years. <coughs> uh, that was, that's why it was important to get, instead of $15,000 going forward, it's only $10,000 a day going forward. So we have a little bit of protection versus what was presented to you 10 days ago going forward. So even with that extra protection though, we're still looking at a savings in the next four years because of that percentage decrease. Go ahead. Correct. A savings over what we pay them and also certainly a savings in budget. And the savings in budget should be recognized too, even though all of those savings don't flow to first student, much of it is fuel, which we pay on our own, but you are correct. Jane has a question. Jane, you have a question, go ahead. I was just thinking that now that we have this virtual thing down, that we won't have many snow days? Well, we don't have the virtual thing down yet, but <laughs> we're certainly getting better at it. Doing a phenomenal job of, of, of what I'm seeing out there coming from our teachers and our support staff and principals, just an incredible job. Uh, we did talk about that with first student. I said, you can expect the marginal snow day that perhaps was a school day two years ago to maybe not be a school day in the future uh, with the tools that we have access to. So that's acknowledged. I think four is a fair estimate, four days. Four is a safe estimate. Any other questions? Are there any other questions? Me in emotion. Just a comment. This is Lance again. Um, I just want to thank you, Bob, for going back and you know the reservations that I had at the last meeting were certainly nothing negative for us first student. I know they've been a great partner for us, um, and I, I definitely take advantage of them in any way. But I did think it was an opportunity for us to uh, really find something that would benefit both sides, and I think you did that. I think you did a good job. Mm -hmm. So I'm in favor of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna unmute. Can you have them hold up a one or two of their first or second name? That might help me. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, I second that. Thank you also, Bob. Mm -hmm. All right, so at this point, I'm going to seek a motion and Clerk Peck is requesting if anybody is the first and second to hold up your hand with a one or a two if you are the first or second. At this point, I am seeking a motion to approve a modification in the first student contract as presented. This would establish a new agreement that extends through the 2024-2025 school year. Modifications to the existing contract includes payment of approximately 82% of school to home costs on 19 pass days where transportation was scheduled to take place and not necessary, and 55% of such costs in the future. 
The percent increase for each of the next five years in the modified contract shall be 2%, 2%, 2.5%, 2.5%, and 2.5%. The district will not pay for any extra trips beyond school to home that do not take place. Seeking a first and second. Jim Jeff, Jeff Lee is a second. Ready. It's a roll call vote, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jim Boucher. Let me get hold. Sorry, hold on one second. Okay. Jim Boucher? Yes. Jeff Lee? Yes. Beth Martin? Yes. Pat McKee? Yes. Teresa Miles? Jane Roosh? Yes. Lance Trolla? Yes. Lee Webster? Yes. Trisha Zunker? Yes. All right, thank you, Bob, for your work on that. Bob. With that, I am seeking a motion to adjourn. Looking, looking for the one and two. Did they hear me? I don't, I'm not unmuted. You're muted. Okay. Oh. I was muted. Okay, with that, I'm seeking a motion to adjourn, and if we could help Clerk Peck, um, who, by the way, I'd like to thank very much. She's working so hard getting us through these virtual meetings. Thank you, Clerk Peck. Um, with that, I'm seeking a motion to adjourn, and if I can see a one and a two, that will help her a lot. I see okay. a two from Lance. I got a pen. Pat McKee. And that's three. <laughs> Jeff Lee's one. Okay. And we don't have to do a roll. Okay. Everybody's a comedian. All right. <laughs> So we have a one and a two, and then are we just? If you want to have them, yay me. Okay. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Have a good night, everybody.